Hi, I'm Dr. Mesh Seibel, and I want to begin by thanking Orion Conferences and the International Conference on Medicine and Pharmacology for inviting me to speak at this conference. I had planned to be here in Barcelona with you, but unfortunately, circumstances prevented that from happening, so I'm grateful for the opportunity to create this presentation for you. For those of you who don't uh, know me, I'm, again, Dr. May Seibel, a member of the faculty at Beth Israel Hospital and Harvard Medical School, a best-selling author, and my most recent book is The Estrogen Fix, and an award-winning musician, which I'll talk more about a little bit later on. And in this presentation, I want to present to you, is estrogen good or bad for you? How to advise your menopausal patients. I have no disclosures, no conflicts of interest. I want to talk to you about five learning objectives in this presentation. Number one, the reframing of menopause. Number two, why the Women's Health Initiative got it wrong. Number three, explain the difference between estrogen plus progestins versus estrogen only. Number four, explain the estrogen window or the window of opportunity or the timing hypothesis, as it's sometimes called. And finally, number five, explain how early menopause and vaginal estrogen are special categories of HRT, or hormone replacement therapy. Now, this is a uh, reframing of menopause, which I'm going to do in this slide, and it's what I call a CME, a continuing menopause education. And it begins with a question, which occurs in all women? Is it infertility? Is it pregnancy? Is it cancer? Or is it menopause? And of course the answer is only menopause occurs in all women. Menopause is not something that's just relegated to a small subset of patients. It is occurring in all women who live long enough to reach menopausal age. I'd like to share for a moment with you why this topic is so important to me, and I think it should be important to you as well, but it's more than just medicine for me. It's, it's quite personal. When I began my career in reproductive medicine and fertility, I had the good fortune of achieving one of the first in vitro fertilization successes in the United States. And this is myself, and this young lady was one of my earlier successes. And I put this picture in because just recently she contacted me to see if I would uh, join her on LinkedIn. So you know it's been a while when your IVF patients are asking you to be linked in with them. And I had done so many of the in vitro fertilizations that I actually was asked by the uh, Franklin Park Zoo to help them to uh, get a gorilla pregnant. This was Gigi, my patient, and her baby ultimately. And uh, this was an article written in People magazine about this ex exceptional uh, experience. It was uh, very exciting. And then something happened. The WHI was published in 2002, and people were so confused by it. It was a tremendously uh, confusing publication because it suggested that the number one most popular medication in the country incorrectly suggested that it caused breast cancer, heart disease, and more. And the headlines came out, risks and benefits of estrogen plus progestin is dangerous, uh, patients weigh quitting the drug after research indicates risk, many taking hormone pills now face a difficult choice. And on and on the headlines went. So this became really a big problem. Women were throwing away their hormone therapy, and all of a sudden the number one most popular medicine in the United States became something that could be toxic to them in their minds. It turns out it wasn't true, and I'm going to share with you why that wasn't true in a few minutes, 
but it scared people and it scared their doctors, as we'll talk more about. And that led to what I call the seven dwarfs of menopause. Itchy, bitchy, sweaty, sleepy, bloated, forgetful, and psycho. Women were having terrible, terrible symptoms as a result of throwing away their hormones. Some uh, 80% of women quit taking their hormones. It was amazing. A little bit less widely appreciated but about the same time in 2002 was another article, this one in the New England Journal of Medicine, and it said that if you do a bilateral salpingo oophorectomy on women who have the BRCA or breast cancer gene, it will lower their risk of developing ovarian or breast cancer. Now this is incredibly important because here we have a prophylactic operation that can lower the risk of cancer in those who are at risk due to a genetic cause, the BRCA gene. And this was a particularly important thing for me and my family because my wife, Dr. Sharon Seibel, was someone who had lost many of the women in her family for generations due to ovarian cancer. And suddenly, there was a possible reason why, and that was this BRCA gene. And in addition to that, there was a action that she could take that would actually lower her risk. And so, after a long discussion, she had the blood drawn and sent it off to the laboratory, and it came back positive for BRCA2. And so... She had surgery that caused her to go into early menopause. She had a bilateral salpingo oophorectomy. And suddenly, only months after the Women's Health Initiative, my wife was thrown into early menopause. And her doctors were reluctant to treat her. They were afraid that it could cause breast cancer or ovarian cancer, which wasn't true, but that's what they were afraid of. And so I made a decision to transition from the infertility world into the menopause world, and that's where I really got started in this area because I had to figure it out so Sharon wouldn't have to tough it out. I feel like this was a a required decision on my part. And also I had a lot of patients who were wondering also because I had been around long enough to have women who had completed their reproduction and were now on Uh, hormone therapy as part of being in menopause. Well, I do want to mention just for completion that this BRCA gene is not only responsible for increasing the risk of breast and ovarian cancer, but also pancreatic cancer. And in fact, six and a half years ago, Sharon was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And I could tell a very long story about this, but I'll condense it to say through the treatment that uh, was a combination of a proton beam and uh, Whipple surgery and a chemotherapy protocol that we submitted to her physicians that her brother uh, came up with and that was used. It, she is now, six and a half years later, disease-free. And so we're very grateful for that. And it's important to realize that we're not just screening people for the BRCA gene for ovarian and breast cancer, but pancreatic cancer and also melanoma are also increased uh, with this gene. Well, um, when she became ill, I took some time off to uh, cut back on patient care to be available to her. And during that time, I developed a, a magazine. It's called The Hot Years. And as a matter of fact, it's a very popular online digital magazine. I make it available free of charge. And if you go to hotyearsmag.com, as you can see here, hotyearsmag.com, you can subscribe to it. You can give it to your patients to subscribe to. It's free. It's digital. And they'll get information on menopause and perimenopause and a lot of interesting things to do with women's health in the 40 to 55 age bracket. And of course, with the BRCA, there'll be some younger as well. 
I also wrote uh, this best number one best-selling book, The Estrogen Window, and uh, it did extremely well. It's recommended by the North American Menopause Society, not only for the patients, but also for physicians, because it's very well uh, documented. All of the references are in the back, and it is very current. And then I updated it most recently in the Estrogen Fix, and these are available, although they are uh, trade books for patients, you'll find them very comprehensive. They're just easy to read. Well, the second learning objective that I want to talk about is why the Women's Health Initiative got it wrong. The Women's Health Initiative was really conceived because people wanted to know if there was a benefit from taking hormone therapy, either estrogen only or estrogen plus progestin. And so in order to do this, they divided up patients, a large number of patients, into those with a uterus, some 16,000 plus women, and those without a uterus. The ones with the uterus had Premarin plus Provera, because Provera at the time was the only oral progesterone or progestin available, and those without a uterus took Premarin only. And that was the way it was set up. This uh, first study I'm going to talk about is the uh, Premarin and Provera arm of it. Later on, in 2004, the Premarin-only arm came out, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Unfortunately, there was a major flaw in the study, and that's because the Premarin and Provera group divided into a placebo group and those that got the medication. And although the range, age range of the patients was somewhere between 50 and 79, it turns out that the women who got the medication were 75% of those women were in their 60s and 70s, whereas the women that got the placebo, 75% of them were in their 50s. So we have a situation where we were com comparing largely women in their 50s who were healthy to women in their 60s and 70s. And while they were supposed to be healthy, many of the women were smokers, they were overweight, they had diabetes, and um, had these risk factors that caused them not to be really and truly a totally healthy or without risk. Well, the results were mind-blowing because it showed that there was an increased risk of breast cancer and coronary heart disease in those who took hormones. But as I said, they were older and had certain risk factors. But the end result was the same, and that is that millions of women threw away their hormones at that time, as I mentioned earlier. And even many doctors hearing all of this repeatedly in the news feared estrogen. And it turns out that this had a lasting impact because in this New England Journal of Medicine article that came out in March of 2016, hormone therapy in the United States is down 80% six, since 2002. And a lot of that decision is surrounded simply by anxiety and confusion, both for the patients and their physicians. And the estrogen void has been filled by many unregulated alternatives. There are many options out there now. And most menopausal women currently are untreated. Worse yet is that there is a new generation of graduates, according to this New England Journal article, who are just lacking in competency in estrogen therapy and in treating menopause. And it's understandable. There's 80% fewer women for them to learn from and 80% less experience giving hormone therapy or treating menopausal patients. And so in spite of the fact that recently professional societies are supporting the use of, of hormone therapy, we have the medical community fearful of it. But the bottom line is, according to a JAMA article in 2017, that among postmenopausal women, 
hormone therapy with conjugated estrogen plus medroxyprogesterone acetate for a median of 5.6 years, or with conjugated equine estrogen alone for a median of 7.2 years, there was no association with risk of all-cause cardiovascular or cancer mortality during a cumulative follow-up of 18 years. In other words, whatever kind of hormone you took, despite what the study showed, there was no cumulative uh, risk or uh, all-cause co- uh, risk of cardiovascular or cancer mortality. Now, the next one that I want to talk about is that of the estrogen window. And what I'm talking about is the window of time to safely begin estrogen for most women. In other words, when do you start taking it? Because this is the key. And it's usually a decade-long time frame between the ages of 50 and 59 or 10 years from the time of menopause if menopause occurs before age 50. So it's important to realize that there's this 10-year window when it's the safest time to begin uh, hormone therapy between 50 and 59 in general and with earlier menopause 10 years from the onset of menopause. This slide looks a little bit more menacing than it is, but in fact, it is simply a summary in the JAMA 2017 article. This is the line of zero. This is On this side is favors hormone therapy. This favors the placebo. And these are the all-cause mortality between the ages of 50 and 59, if it's begun between 50 and 59. And you can see that whether you took estrogen only or estrogen plus progestin, if you begin between the ages of 50 and 59, it favors being on hormone therapy. All-cause mortality is less if you took the hormones. If you're between the ages of 60 and 69, the benefits and risks are about the same. All-cause mortality is basically more or less around uh, unity. It's not better or not worse. It's not until you start giving hormones in the 70s, between the ages of 70 and 79, that we start seeing more mortality in the hormone treatment group than in the um, in the placebo group, than in the uh, hormone group. So the point of the matter is, is that if you can start it in your 50s or in your 60s, if you must be late, but no later than that, then you stay pretty much in a safe uh, time to begin. And by far, the safest is in the... 50s to begin. I want to now move for learning objective three is the the difference between estrogen and progestin versus estrogen only. Women on estrogen and progestin, the PREM Pro group, when we look at the number of events per 10,000 women, They had an additional seven cardiovascular heart disease events, an additional eight strokes, additional eight cases of breast cancer, pulmonary embolus, although they had six less cases of colon cancer and five less cases of hip fracture. Now, these differences were increased, but remember, 75% of the women were in their 60s and 70s when they got the medication. But this is just looking at the raw data. This is what they found. If you look at a study in the New England Journal called the ELITE study, the early versus late intervention trial with estrogen, here we have 643 women. They took estradiol, one milligram, plus a vaginal progesterone, a bioidentical progesterone, 45 milligrams vaginally. And it was either begun less than six years after menopause or greater than 10 years after menopause. And they measured carotid artery thickness, intimal thickness, or carotid coronary artery calcium. 
And what they found is if you waited until after 10 years to begin estrogen, estradiol, and progesterone, there's really no difference here in the placebo versus the estradiol. But if you look at less than six years, six years or less, you can see that taking estradiol lowered intimal thickness versus placebo. So we see benefits by starting it early. And that's important because the number one killer in women is heart disease. As a matter of fact, uh, if you look at conventional treatments right now, besides hormone therapy, aspirin and statin therapy do not consistently improve outcomes in women, whereas estrogen does. And estrogen is protective against plaque formation, but if you start it later, it can destabilize plaques that are already farm formed. And this becomes important in this cartoon. Here we see premenopausal years and postmenopausal years. And down here we see the evolution of a plaque. We see fatty streaks and fatty plaques, atherosclerotic plaques, unstable plaques, and clinical events. If you look at the original um, observational studies before the Women's Health Initiative, most of them were done right at the time of menopause, in the first 10 years after menopause. And so they were mostly fatty plaques and atherosclerotic plaques, but the clinical trials that involved these later use of, of hormone therapy have, gave it to women in their 60s and 70s, and they had unstable plaques, and that led to clinical events. And so it's very important to realize that the pathology of aging in the arteries is going on in the absence of hormone therapy, and that results in adverse events. And while women fear breast cancer, 4% of death in women is due to breast cancer, whereas 53% of deaths in women is due to cardiovascular disease. And so cardiovascular disease is something that we have to be aware of as being helped if hormone therapy is start, started earlier in the estrogen window. Now, this is a very interesting slide because it, it uh, calls out data from a couple of papers in the American Journal of Cardiology and the journal Menopause. And what it looks at is, suppose you have a woman who's a little bit older and you're trying to figure, is she at risk for cardiovascular disease or not? Well, we can never say 100%, but what we can say is if her LDL cholesterol is less than 130, she statistically does better in terms of risk of uh, cardiovascular heart disease. If her LDL-HDL ratio is less than 2.5, she does much better. And if she does not have metabolic syndrome, so if you find a woman who's a little bit older and you're worried, can you begin hormone therapy? One way to tease it out is to see if her LDL is less than 130, her LDL-HDL ratio is less than 2.5, and she does not have metabolic syndrome. If those things are found, then it is the safest possible to initiate hormone therapy in that woman versus if these other values are present. Now, you can also modify the risk in other ways. For instance, transdermal estrogen is probably less risk for uh, blood clots, stroke, etc., because uh, less clotting factors by avoiding the enteropathic circulation. You can widen the interval of giving progesterone. One way that's, that is used, particularly in uh, Finland and other parts of the world because of their work, is the use of a progesterone IUD, which can help to uh, protect the uterine lining. And most recently, DUA-V, which is um, a combination of Premarin plus Benzodoxyphen, which is a, uh, a serum that helps to protect the uterine lining and appears not to increase the risk of heart disease and may be protective in breast cancer, though the data is still not uh, clear on that. 
If you look at, though, why women worry, heart disease may be what kills more women, but why they worry is breast cancer. And it's understandable. It's a pretty scary disease. It turns out that in the Women's Health Initiative, the risk of breast cancer, even in the um, estrogen and progestin study, in the first release, the actual risk of increase of breast cancer uh, was only about the same as women who are drinking a glass of wine a day. In fact, women who have naturally dense breasts or who are obese have a greater risk of breast cancer than the women in the Women's Health Initiative study. Now, the women who came up, uh, who had estrogen only, is a very different story than the estrogen plus progestin story. And here's what I mean by that. It turns out that in this article from the New England Journal of Medicine, looking from March of 2016, and this is looking at the actual original 2002 data, but it just calculated it by age categories. If you look at the breast cancer risk with estrogen only, this is CEE alone, there's actually a reduction in breast cancer for women who get estrogen only, particularly if they started in the estrogen window of 50 to 59 or within 10 years of menopause. So here we have a reduction in breast cancer. There's also a reduction, a significant reduction in coronary heart disease, stroke, Colorectal cancer, all cancers, all fractures, death from any cause, and importantly in today's world, a huge reduction in the risk of diabetes. But this breast cancer risk actually goes down. There is a very slight increased risk of deep vein thrombosis. Now, in this report done in the American Journal of Public Health by Phil Sorrell and uh, others, uh, they looked at what was the risk of not taking hormone therapy in women age 50 to 59 who had a hysterectomy. What was their risk of not taking estrogen only? And through an actuarial analysis using the actual data from the Women's Health Initiative, they felt that deaths due to no estrogen resulted in 40 to 48,000 excess deaths between 2002 and 2011. So they were 40 to almost 50,000 women died unnecessarily, prematurely, as a result of avoiding estrogen. That's a pretty important point to make when we're trying to consider do we give hormone therapy or not. And other studies show a decreased mortality in hysterectomized women who receive it before the age of 60. The Women's Health Initiative, which I've mentioned, uh, other uh, RCT meta studies, the uh, Dutch osteoporosis study, another study by Kaiser Permanelli, uh, all show significant reductions in mortality in women who receive estro estrogen before the age of 60. Finally, in my last learning objective point, early menopause and vaginal estrogen are special categories. First of all, I want to mention that the incidence of early menopause is not as rare as you might think. 1 in 10 to 1 in 20 women go into menopause before age 45, and this is a big risk factor. 1 in 100 before age 40. 1 in 1,000 before age 30, and 1 in 10,000 before age 20. And I have patients in all of these categories. Sometimes I do coaching for people by phone or by Skype from women from Europe or in other parts of the world, and many of them are the younger women who are trying to figure out what to do. There's also estrogen window and the cancer the breast cancer previvors. There are all these women now who are aware of the BRCA gene and other genes and are having their ovaries removed to lower the risk of breast and ovarian cancer. 
and many of them are being told to have their ovaries out at age uh, 40, uh, age 35, or certainly before age 40. So they're going to be going into uh, early menopause, and this is a big risk factor for these women, and many of their oncologists are still concerned about giving them hormone therapy. Well, Angelina Jolie, the actress and producer, is a really excellent role model. She had a couple of very public uh, articles that were in the New York Times several years ago in which she disclosed that she was BRCA1, that she had a bilateral mastectomy done, and subsequently she had a bilateral salpingo oophorectomy done. She had her uterus retained. She had a... uh, progestin uh, IUD inserted, and she went on an estrogen, estradiol patch. And so she wanted to make public awareness about this so that women would understand that the importance of hormone therapy is quite great in terms of maintaining health, youth, vigor, Uh, workability, and many other things. So I'm grateful to her, although I'm sorry for her trials and tribulations that she had to go through, but she has created a tremendous role model for women. And really another interesting point is that, you know, all of these women who are younger that are failed IVF, they go through and are poor responders, these are women who are likely to be going into early menopause spontaneously. And we really have to keep an eye on them so that they are in our radar for hormone therapy because they may be having menopause uh, in the very near future. And early menopause does come with certain risks. They have an increased overall mortality. They have an increased risk of cardiovascular heart disease. They have an increased risk of osteoporosis and autoimmunity and psychiatric illnesses, including suicidal ideation and depression and many others, and increased risk of neurological diseases, including Parkinsonism. So they are at increased risk unless they're treated. This is a very important thing to treat these women with hormone therapy, at least up into the time of Uh, menopause or natural menopause, which would be about age 51 or longer. And for the women with the BRCA, we now know from studies that treating them with hormone therapy does not increase their risk of breast cancer or ovarian cancer over the risk that they have inherently in the genetics of that problem, but it doesn't further increase their risk. So there's not a reason to withhold hormone therapy from women in early menopause unless they have other uh, additional confounding factors uh, beyond what I've talked about. I want to mention hysterectomy because it's a very common operation. It's second only to C-section as a major surgery in the United States. And there's been over 6 million of these procedures done in the last 10 years, about 600,000 a year, And the ovaries are removed in about 54%. But just to make it clear that that doesn't mean that they won't go into early menopause because it turns out that within three years, about 30% of the ovary of the women will go into menopause due to disruption of blood flow. And by seven years, virtually everybody who has their uterus removed will be in menopause due to basically infarction of the ovaries due to reduced blood supply and disruption of the blood supply at surgery. And let's look at the most common ages that hysterectomy are done, at least in the United States. 40 to 44 years old is the most common time that women have a hysterectomy. The second most common time is 35 to 39 years. And 46.1 is the average age of uh, having a hysterectomy with 20% having it before age 35. These are very young women who are going to have uh, early menopause and should be considered for hormone therapy. Um, Finally, about uh, 50 
By age 50 to 54, one-third of women in the United States will have had a hysterectomy, and by 55 to 59, the rate is just over 40%. So there's a lot of women who are, who are candidates for estrogen only that should be considered to receive it. And right now in the United States, there's about 15 million plus women under 60 who've had a hysterectomy. Now the estrogen window and the vagina is also important because uh, the vagina naturally is about the size of lip gloss in terms of its uh, opening, its natural opening, but it does stretch because of the rugae and it, the elasticity of enough to allow a baby to come out. But at the same time, it can be so uh, atrophic that there can be difficulty just doing an exam. And most people that have been in practice know that it can be very challenging to do a just a, a bimanual exam or to view the cervix or to view the vaginal cuff with a uh, speculum. Now this is a slide uh, provided to me by Dr. Murray Freeman. And here you can see the Consequences of Genitourinary Syndrome of Menopause. This is the urethra, and you can see that the vaginal canal is incredibly restricted, and this is going to cause not only dryness, but painful sex. Here you can see two women who were um, sexually active. They're both 65 years of age. And here you see that in this lady, Therapy was discontinued, vaginal estrogen was discontinued three years previously, and you can see more pallor in this, uh, in this tissue and narrowing of this tissue compared to this woman who's 65, but her introitus looks relatively uh, premenopausal. So the estrogen window for the vagina is interesting because it never closes. And by that I mean you can resume giving estrogen therapy at any time and get a response. So it's important that you realize that many times the vaginal atrophy and the genital urinary syndrome of menopause don't happen until about three years after menopause. And as a result of that, many women don't associate it with menopause or the atrophy that goes with it. And the consequence of that is they don't treat it. They don't come in for it. They just think it's natural. And it's not. So these are the learning objectives that I wanted to cover with you. Reframing menopause. It happens to every woman. Number two, the WHI, the Women's Health Initiative, got it wrong. They compared apples and oranges. Explained to you that while estrogen and progestin together still, if given in the estrogen window, still do not negatively affect lifespan and can have many positive effects, estrogen only actually lowers the risk of breast cancer, heart disease, and many other conditions explain that this timing is essential and critical, that the estrogen window is a time of 50 to 59 or beginning it within 10 years of the onset of menopause if menopause is earlier. And finally, uh, that early menopause and vaginal estrogen are special categories that we really have to be aware of into even if we cannot give women systemic hormones that, according to a, uh, an opinion piece by the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists that came out in 2016, even if a woman has estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, she can still receive vaginal estrogen uh, without increasing her risk for recurrence or death, according to the research that they published in their opinion piece. So I want to thank Orion Conferences and the International Conference on Medicine and uh, Pharmacology for allowing me to give this presentation. I mentioned at the beginning that I uh, was also a musician, so I'm going to conclude with a song called Growing Old Gracefully, which I'll attach after this. I hope you enjoy it, 
and I thank you for allowing me to make this a presentation. I'd like to play a song now that I wrote, it's the original tune. You know, everybody wants to live longer, but nobody wants to get older. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that? So here's a song called Growing Old Gracefully. Well, back in the days for liposuction, tummy tuck and facial reconstruction, we all learned to live with what we got. For Botox and facial peel, white shade of her teeth was real. Didn't try to be who we were not. You could tell a friend's cover. You could tell your sister from your brother. <laughs> Biggest gold life did not used to be. Looking 30 at age 53. Well, back in the days for keratoplasty, wearing glasses wasn't nasty. All we really wanted was to see, see, see. Didn't try to fool no one. We were less, we had more fun. We learned to grow old gracefully. You could tell a book by its cover. You could tell your sister from your mother. <laughs> Biggest gold life did not used to be. Looking 30 at age 53. Well, before we were the Prozac nation, imperfection on occasion didn't cause a single tear to fall. We didn't plug ball scalp with hair, and when we grade, we didn't care. The goal was not to be a Barbie doll. You could tell a book by its cover. You could tell your sister from your mother. Biggest gold life did not used to be. Getting carded at age 53. We learned to grow old gracefully. Thank you. Thank you very much.